Hello YouTube, this is Sam Gerrans from quarternight.com. Today is Monday the 9th of August 2021 and uh, I'm, what I want to do today is to make a video to share what I have learnt about um, how to read the Quran in Arabic and how to benefit from that. Now, um, it may not be immediately apparent why, why I want to to talk on this subject but um, I hope I'm going to hit the main points here just so you know um, I already made this video it, it took about an hour and when I'd finished doing it I discovered that uh, for some reason it wasn't recording the audio so uh, if I seem a bit sort of glib as I kind of go through these points it's because I've already done it once but I'm going to try to make a shorter version and just try to hit the main points so first of all why would you want to learn to read the Quran in Arabic um, Usually that's taken as a, as a sort of self-evident benefit, but it isn't always a self-evident benefit. <clears throat> the problem is that a lot of people um, read the Qur'an in Arabic without understanding what they're saying. And if that's you or you think that there is a, a benefit to doing that, then I, I would really say you've got to go back and kind of consider your, your kind of, you know, your analytical process. <clears throat> what other book would you read and not understand it just doesn't make any sense. So that's the first thing. The second thing is is that you know, so if 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 you're studying it in the Arabic and you're really not getting it at all, I would say read it in translation. I, d I don't mean necessarily my translation. Obviously, I think my translation is best. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done it. But there are other excellent translations out there. I I'm personally, I think uh, A. J. Arbery has got a very good translation. You could look at that one. There are more <clears throat> sort of flowery um, sort of ex planetary ones like um, Muhammad Assad is a, a very clever guy he's got some wonderful notes and I, I, I quote him copiously actually in my own work so there are, there are translations out there which are which are pretty good <clears throat> um, but there is a benefit from learning to read the Quran in Arabic there are several uh, one is is that you you know you're engaging with the actual words on the page and seeing the roots you know you see ah oh, this this word is related to this word ah oh, there's a kind of you know there's a these two words are, are operating together you won't get that in a translation. It's just it's just not possible. So you, you know, there are definite benefits. The other real benefit from it is that you become free of the traditionalists. Ah, oh, well, you don't read it in the Holy Arabic language. Well, the Holy Arabic language is... Now we're going to talk about what, what we mean when we talk about Arabic. Now, the, the non-Arabic speaker is a bit at a bit of a disadvantage because... Any Arabic, any Arabic speaker or any speaker of the many dialects of Arabic has got this kind of like this thing over him that he can use. Say, well, you don't speak Arabic, therefore, you know, your opinion isn't worth anything, whatever it is. Maybe he's right. I don't know. But I, I, I would argue that he isn't. And the reason why I would argue this, first of all, you need to know that Arabic isn't just one language. It's not like there, there's this one Arabic and everyone speaks it and you don't. So therefore, you know nothing. Therefore, your opinion doesn't count. Even if you do speak Arabic, if you speak one of the one of the dialects of Arabic, um, there will still be new reasons why your opinion doesn't count. So if you if you speak Arabic, let's say you speak Moroccan Arabic, well, that's the wrong kind of Arabic. You know, what 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 what, what do we care about you? Well, let's say you speak a, you know a, an Arabic dialect that's closer to what we're talking about in the Quran. Well, then you know and you're a native speaker of it, let's say that, well, you didn't study at Al-Azhar, you didn't, you didn't study under this mullah, you know, you're, and let's say you did, let's say you went all, to all the right universities and you collected all the right pieces of paper, but you still have an opinion which doesn't comport with what they say, just a heretic. So you, what I'm trying to say is you can't win on this game. It's designed to be unwinnable, but it's also designed to be unstartable. So, and, and also the way that the, and I'm not saying it's true for all teachers, but, um, Quite, from what I've seen, quite a lot of the, ca the cases is that the teaching of the Quranic Arabic is just, un that's an unwinnable thing too. When I started my degree, which was in Russian language and literature, the professor at my first university, because I transferred out of this university pretty much on the basis of what he said, at the first lecture, he stood up, uh, stood up and said, uh, Russian, which is what I was studying, he said, Russian is very difficult. I thought, is it? I'm pretty sure. I mean, I hadn't met a lot of Russians by that time. I have since. And I can tell you that there are plenty of incredibly stupid Russian people who manage to <laughs> speak their own language without any difficulty whatsoever. So, you know, what he was really doing was setting himself up as this 
how important he is and, and, and how knowledgeable he must be to be able to do this very difficult thing. In some ways, just so you know, Russian is much easier than English. Uh, for example, the spelling of Russian, I mean, there are a few things you have to know, but pretty much it's phonetic. Uh, the, um, the, the tense system in Russian is, uh, you know, like, you know, sort of present continuous, present, uh, present is perfect and so on, is, is way English, way easier than English rather. There's just five of them. Um, Russians think there are three, but actually there's five, but that's it. And they're very simple. So there are some things where Russian is very simple. There are some things where it's, bit, you know, requires a bit of work and so on. But saying that it's also complicated and so difficult really is just there to put you at a disadvantage. So that's one thing. And that's kind of what you get from the way quite often that the Quranic Arabic is taught, not in all cases. I haven't seen all cases, so I can't speak to it. But from what I've seen. OK, so there's that. The other thing is, is that learning languages. We can all do it because we've all done it. I mean, everybody listening to this video has learned English you know, they're either, they're either non-native speakers who've learned it well enough to understand what I'm talking about, or they're native speakers. We've all learnt languages, and we all learnt our, our native language without any problem whatsoever. The problem really comes is the way that languages are taught. And as I say, I have a language degree, so I, I suffered at the hands of the incorrect way of teaching languages probably more than anybody. It's, it's, it's brutal and pointless and really, really... Um, unproductive. What happens is, every, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So when you go to when you go to school, they sit you down in these idiotic rows where you don't really do anything, and what they're doing is crushing the life out of you. That's what schools are for. If you don't know, um, it's the Prussian school of education, which is designed by the Prussians to brainwash young boys into being so suppliant, so compliant, so having the life so crushed out of them so that when they were told in, in a trench to get up and march over a trench into oncoming um, machine gun fire, they would do it. That's why they designed this system of education. It was to brutalize you and cauterize your soul. That's why they designed it. Look it up, Prussian, the Prussian education system. That's been rolled out as the standard across the world. Now, under this system, which is basically a hammer beating the life out of you, until eventually you're so demoralized, dejected and depressed, then it's what they're actually doing is teaching you to put up with long, long periods of total inanity and boredom to prepare you for the working world. That's what it's for, to make you into a slave. That's what it's for. It's actually why, why it was designed this way. It sounds like a wild conspiracy theory, but actually this is true. So that's why they did it that way. Now, under that system, this is the hammer. And to a hammer... Everything looks like a nail. So they sit you down and make you learn, let's say, mathematics. So this is how you learn with the teacher at the front of the room, you sitting there memorizing these things and doing exercises. Well, this is how they teach you languages. But that isn't how you learned your native language. No, the way you learned your native language was by doing stuff and getting results. It was, it's it's an, an applied thing. You you, you, you hear something, you, you try it, you get a response, you try that you misunderstand half understand piece it all together in a kind of an intuitive way that's, that's how you actually learn your own language and you got really good at it that's why you can speak it okay just to give it kind of another example computers we all learned to use computers now if computing if using a computer had been done the way that everything is done in schools being able to um check your email would be like a a high order activity that only very few people can do because schools are so inefficient. They're utterly useless at teaching anything. The best case scenario is that they don't make you absolutely hate it. OK, that's 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 what success looks like for a school. OK, so schools are horrible places to learn pretty much anything you do get the occasional amazing teacher who manages you know a bit like the grass growing up between between the paving stones you know just you just you think how does that manage to keep doing that you do get those you know very few people but they're all being weeded out if you'd excuse the pun at the moment so anyway all that to say is schools are awful places universities are worse for learning anything like this but when 
the traditionalist teaches or a native Arabic speaker teaches his language as well. What he's also doing, not only has he got all this, because he's been through the Prussian system as well, right? He's also kind of, he's coming at it as somebody who speaks a form of Arabic. And I know this from Russian. If you listen to Russians teaching Russian, they have a completely different approach to it. Um, and they think that certain things are important. And when they're teaching non non native speakers of Russian, they think other things are important. And it all gets very technical and very dry and very boring very, very, very quickly and unusable. So there's that. When you start to learn any language, uh, let's take Arabic. Well, let's take, yeah, the way that the Quranic Arabic is taught. What they do, generally speaking, and if you know some exceptions to this, great. But, but what I've seen is they load you up with stuff that you really don't need. I'm not saying it's not important at all. I'm saying it's just you don't need it. And it would be uh, it would be like you want to drive a car. So now we're going to study the history of the development of tarmac and road laying and bitumen development over the last, you know, 3000 years from the or whatever it was, you know, or uh, you don't need this. What you want is a key, a car, Somebody who kind of knows what they're doing next to you. And let's just, you know, let's just hit the gas and see what happens. That you will learn. And that's how we all learned to use computers. We just ignored school. We jumped on there. We said, what if I click that? And you're going through these patterns and you're, you're learning things. And, you, you know, it's crashing. Oh, well, we'll try and reboot that. And we actually learned by using it. As I say, if we'd been up to schools, if we had learned the school method this wouldn't be possible. None of none of the internet would be possible, okay? Because school would have beaten it out of us, and there would be a very few people with you know incredible job titles who are able to turn the thing on and off, you know. And we'd be all sitting there. We we'd all be terrified, but we're not terrified. We just use it. Why? Because we use the bits that we actually need. We don't learn about bits and bytes and terabytes and storage and blah 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 blah. Well, not if you want to use a computer. You can learn that stuff, but let's just turn it on and see what happens next. And that's really how language, when it works, that's how that's how you learn. That's how you learn your own language. OK, but because of the, the, the holy language of Arabic and the holy, holy, you know, way you have to see it and all of this stuff, they load you up with all this incredibly complicated stuff. So you can't really get started. So. I'm against that. I'm against, I'm, I'm against it because it doesn't work, okay? It's not just that I have an ideological difficulty with it. It doesn't work, so why would you do it? So that's the first thing. The next thing is to do with the holy language of Arabic because they would have you, you know. Let's just deal with this. There is such a thing as Arabic, okay? But it's it's a very broad church. And it's much, if, you're gonna, if you were going to use like a food analogy, it's much, much more like spaghetti than it is like sushi. It's large and sprawling and intermerged. Yes, it is kind of one thing, but it isn't as well. It's it, it, but it, what it isn't is is neatly packaged little kind of um, as, you know little boxes like sushi. It's not like that. So in in European languages, you have, for example, you have Latin, which was the church language. And then you have other languages which are recognized as being other languages, but they're related to, to Latin. So you've got Italian, you've got, I don't know, Catalan, you've got Spanish, you've got um, Portuguese, uh, R Romanian. These languages which have some sort of, they're at a tangent to Latin and anybody speaking those languages going into Latin is going to be a great advantage to anybody else because they've already got all these stock of words. They already have kind of a similar sort of grammar, French, very close, all of these sorts of things. Are they Latin? Are they, do they grow up speaking Latin as a native language? No, they don't, but it is easier for them to learn it. This is closer to what's going on with Arabic, okay? You don't normally get this kind of presentation. It, it it all looks like spaghetti to you. So to you, it's all spaghetti. It must all be Arabic. And they kind of let you think that, but it's not true. What Arabs actually do is they they grow up speaking. Well, depends how they do it, but quite often they, they usually they grow up speaking a dialect. If they're growing up in Egypt, they'll speak one particular way. If they're growing up in the Levant, they're going to speak another kind of way. If they're growing up in uh, Qatar or something, they're going to speak another kind of way. If, they speak, if they're growing up in um, Morocco, they're going to be speaking a different... In the Sudan, it's a different kind of Arabic. These are, if you want to put it in these terms, 
Catalan, Portuguese, Spanish, and so on. Sure, they have a, a very close, depending on where you are, connection with this Quranic Arabic, but none of them, none, not one of them, is growing up speaking Quranic Arabic as a native language. Okay, But they kind of let you think that they are, but they're not. It's, it's a lie. Well, at the very least, it's a live omission. And it's uh, what we call in Russian dust in the eyes. So they're letting you have this dust in the eyes. So does it mean that they are at a, you know, they don't have an advantage? Sure, they have an advantage in some ways. Just like I would have an advantage as a native English speaker um, in Shakespearean English. Okay, Shakespearean English, I can read, but I go to the glossary all the time because we don't use some of these words now. Or um, there are certain words which we do use, but we use them in a very different sense now. Okay, and, and this is just a couple of hundred years ago. Now go back to Chaucer, Chaucerian English. Weapon and a whaling and care and other sora. You know, what? You know, it, 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 it's, <laughs> you have to kind of go through it very, very carefully because it, it's so, so different. Now, as a native speaker of English, modern English, if I was to talk to somebody of Chaucer's time, I mean, he, his, his first language probably was, was French. You know, so it would be very difficult for us to have a conversation. I might be able to pick out the general gist of it. Now, I'm not saying that those divergences are the, are the same or even comparable between any one of the modern types of Arabic and the Quranic Arabic. I'm just saying that there are some parallels there. And quite often, especially with the, um, the so-called scholars presentation, they rather leave you with the impression that, all knowledge is based in their hands and, and you know nothing and to, to learn anything is this incredibly difficult thing. And quite honestly, they make it quite difficult. But I'm going to show you something now. So I'm just going to switch over into this if I can make that work. Yes. Um, this book here is a book which has got the, the rules of Tajweed. I, I will mention Tajweed in a moment. But what I want to do is just direct your attention to these this is all in arabic this isn't for english speakers this is for arabic readers and all these these this isn't this isn't tafsir this is these are word definitions just as i would have as an english reader of uh, chaucer or shakespeare certainly just just a couple of hundred years ago explaining to me as a native speaker of the english language words that you know I, i'm not going to get so look how many and and also I wanted to add, quite often, if you look, and I've spent many, many hours in, in Islamic bookshops looking at various copies of the Qur'an or online looking at different copies, usually the high quality, high quality uh, editions with these notes are sold out. They're really hard to get. Not this particular one, and the paper's not very good here, but I mean, I'm talking about high quality editions. They're invariably sold out, very hard to get. Why? Because... Your native Arabic speaker prefers these because they help him to read the Quran. Now, I'm sure people in the comments can say, I'm a native Arabic speaker. I've never used these, etc. I'm not saying that that no Arabic speaker understands the Quran. That isn't what my argument is. I'm saying that these books are popular amongst native Arabic speakers or speakers, native speakers of various Arabic dialects because they need these words explained to them okay so just i'm trying to put the um some of the um, oppression <laughs> that the, the tension that you get put under as a learner of the quran i'm trying to put this into some sort of bigger context the context which makes it doable so that's the first thing now i'm going to move on to the question of reading the quran in arabic and some approaches that you can use that have helped me I've been through many systems of my own devising and they've evolved and I just found myself kind of doing a new book as it were or working working on a, starting a new actual you know copy I thought that might be useful for other people to look at so what I want to do is to start really at the beginning and the beginning is to find yourself a copy when I say a copy I'm talking about an edition of the Quran in Arabic that you like. You're going to spend a lot of time with this book, so it has to be something that you, you like the feel of. I mean, I'll show you the one that, that I like and you know explain why, but this may be different for you, and if that's the case, that's absolutely great. So anyway, this is the edition that I like. It's got a nice, a nice hard uh, cover. Um, I really like the layout. It's got... Um, 
it's got the juice sort of number up here. So once you once you learn how to read that, you'll know where you are. You've got the uh, you've got the Sura title up here. You've also got quite a lot of real estate um, around the edges. Unfortunately, you you it's very difficult to find a printer sensible enough not to include all this ornamentation, which uses up quite a lot of um, real estate, unfortunately. But also the quality of the paper. I don't know why the camera is not in focus for some reason. Um, the quality of the paper. Let's see if we can. Is absolutely wonderful uh, on on this particular edition. It, it it feels nice under the hand. It's 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 really well made. Now, I spent a long time looking for this sort of thing, and what I would suggest is, when you find one that you like <clears throat> and you're sure that you like it and it meets the, those criteria, buy a few. I mean, I actually bought I bought ten copies of this. Uh, I've rather misguidedly given a few copies away as gifts to people that I've liked. I wanted to give them a nice gift. What what better gift could you give them than a really nice addition to the quarter? So I've only actually got about four left. <clears throat> but if I'd been um, a little bit more prudent, I would have hold, held on to those. But I would I would I would say get several because if you find something that you really like, you may not get it again. The Arabic, the Arab world is not highly re reliable as you'll find if you deal with it, you know, in anything to do with publishing. So if you do find something that you like, get it now and sort of store it away. That would be <clears throat> my piece of advice. So you found an edition that you like, you've bought five or six or seven or eight copies and sort of squirreled those away. What's the first thing that you do? Well, the first thing you do, <clears throat> the first thing that you do in our sort of process. Hold on, let's see if I can get this camera right. Yeah, is when you open it up, you will find this. This is obviously the book marker. And the first thing you really want to do is, before you do anything else, is basically make a knot at the end of this. If you don't do that, what will happen is this will fray and that would not be good. So you make a knot right at the end. That's the number one thing you do. <clears throat> okay, so now you've got your knot. The next thing is what you're going to do is you're going to prepare this book for a lifetime of you and vice versa. Especially if it's a well-made book and it's 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 being you know the, the the production is is of a high quality, which is what you're looking for. And I'm I'm choosing a book here that's not too big. I think it's like four inches by about five, five and a half, something like that. Something I can carry with me. It's got a good, you know, good hard cover and everything. If it's of a high quality, it's it needs to be eased. Now, this is the kind of what you find, because what you want it to, to fall open and lie flat, you see, because you can spend a lot of time with this thing. But it won't do that when you first start with it. So what you want to do is ease the book. And the way you do that. Uh, if you've you know if you've ever picked up a, a Bible that's been you know read over generations or any other book that's been a high quality book that's been read over generations, what you find is that the the, the the leaves open and lie down flat. It's very obliging. Well, you can make a book obliging, and this is how you do it. So I just uh, see if yeah. So here we are. So we've done our done our ribbon. You start off with a book like this. I hope you can see. Maybe I can pull this out a little bit. Oops. So what you do is you take a page and you just push it down top to bottom. If you're doing it the first time, you want to be a bit gentle with it. Again here, top to bottom. Next page, top to bottom. Just easing it. Next page, top to bottom, like that. See, you're actually pressing down. Obviously, I, you know, uh, you, you get the the concept. This will take some time. You need to go through the whole thing. I mean, it take, take you half an hour to do it properly, and you may have to do it twice. Don't over push it, but what you want to do is ease it. And once you've done it a couple of times, going through the whole thing very gently, and just gently easing it and easing it, you do it two or maybe even three times. Maybe on the third time, you can do every other page or every four or five pages, something like that. But at the end of that, the spine will have been eased. The paper will then lie pretty much flat. And you'll feel like, you know, it will be obliging to you. It will sort of yield to you rather than, you know, you're sort of kind of like fighting, 
fighting it. It'll just it'll open to the page that you want and all the rest of that. So that's the first thing. Now I'm going to move on to what I do with the book and some of this you might find useful. Hold on a second. All right, so this is the copy that I'm using at the moment. This is the one I've been working on over the last couple of days. This is the one I'm now going to use as my kind of current copy, as it were. So the first thing is I'm going to pull this out Hold on. like that. So the first thing I do is I get myself a cover. Now, this cover I bought, I think it was, is it called Etsy? I can't remember. I think it's called Etsy or something like that. It's a bit like a kind of eBay where people who can actually make stuff handicrafts and things like that make stuff for you and I just I like this way I like this way of doing it and I bought this I can't remember how much I paid for it 25 quid or something like that and it's got magnetic obviously you choose one you like but this is how I do it and also a, a, a pencil can kind of go in there and stuff so that's it now once you've eased the book the book will then easily slip into these covers and what it is is it's a, a book cover like this so you've You've uh, bought your five or eight or whatever copies it is, and then you've got this cover. This cover will last you for probably, you know, you get a good one for the rest of your life. And because you've got these books already bought, they will all fit, you know, in here. You send the guy the right measurements, of course. And, and so, you know, you're kind of set on that front and you've learned to ease the book properly. It's all gone in there. So that, that section is done. Now I'm going to show you what I do next, okay? What I do is um, I put the surah and the verse number whatever it is the you know, at the top of the page on the outside edge so here and here right the way through now i'm going to give you some advice which you will um, probably ignore and then you'll regret it <laughs> and then you'll take it which is i would go through and do all of these in light pencil first okay if at all possible. I would recommend doing it in light pencil first. If you don't do that, what will happen is, if you don't do it in light pencil first, you'll do it in pen and you'll make a mistake. And then, you know, you won't listen. I'm sure you won't. I wouldn't have done, but I wish I had the first time. Do it in pencil all the way through. It'll take, it'll take you know, a, a good hour, hour and a half, something. Make, this, make these letters as big as possible. Make these numbers as big as possible as big as comfortably possible because what you want to be able to do is navigate your way across the Quran really, really quickly. Um, this thing is not working very fast. I'm not able to sort of switch between the, the two camera modes that I really want. So I'm kind of having to wait for it to catch up. You've got this here. Why is this good? It means you can get across the text really quickly. It's nice to know the sort of names and all the rest of it if you, if you can, but what you really want to do is to be able to get through really, really quickly and that's what this allows you to do. OK, so I recommend doing that and I recommend doing it in biro. Do not be using a fountain pen. It will go through the page. Don't use a felt tip pen. It will go through the page. If you only use a pencil to do it, when we get to the next stage, you'll lose the numbers in, in the rest of what we're going to be writing, which is all going to be in pencil. Pretty well, all of it. So use a, a, a I use a black biro. Test it on another piece of paper. Make sure that it's not too strong. The other thing is, before I forget that, yeah, let's do that, is when you're writing them, uh, yeah. you've got a piece of paper here, let's say. You're writing, you, you write the numbers on here and on the other side. As you get to that side and you, you turn the page over, here we are turning it over. You want a kind of piece of blotting paper when you write the next number and then the next number and you take this down and use it as blotting. Otherwise, what you'll do is you'll end up with marks on the page and you want to avoid that. The last thing on this part, I would say, is you've written it in a pencil. You probably won't the first time. You probably will ignore what I've said there, but but the second time you will write it in pencil, check it all the way through, then write it in pen over the top blotting it then what you want to do is you, if you want to rub out the pencil underneath that don't do it immediately wait do it next time or you know maybe you won't even see it be fine but if you try to do it immediately the ink will still be slightly wet and damp and it will run and it will smudge the page okay so i'm just giving you all the stuff that i've learned of all the times that i've tried different approaches so there's that now the other thing that i do you may not have a need for this but 
what I, I spent an awful lot of time working out the meaning of al-khuruf al-muqatta'at and the, the mysterious letters. And now that I know them, I want to know precisely which, <laughs> which um, surahs have got them all the way through the surah. So I include those. If you want to know what they are too, I have a video on it, but it's seven years, seven years long. It feels like seven years long, seven hours long, but it's now as a, a downloadable PDF. You'll find it on the quarternight.com site. If you just go to either of the books, you'll find it there and you know you can get that. But what I do is I include that here. So Tarsin uh, Meme, we have this here. This is just you know one of these... Uh, one of these mysterious combination, combinations of mysterious letters. So I, I put that on the inside here all the way through where it occurs in a particular surahs. That's just me. You may not feel you want to do that, but, but I do that. So that's all I do in pen. I do it in black ballpoint pen. I've done it in pencil first. I've gone all the way through again. This takes a lot of time. You know, you're, you're preparing something that you're going to be using a lot. And, and we'll, we'll get to this you know, this isn't just sort of some kind of, um, you know, a hyper kind of controlling way of doing something. You're preparing the ground for something you're going to be using a lot. And so that's why I do this. So you've done this. Now I'm going to get onto what, what happens on actual pages. So I've prepared one page, um, the beginning of Surah Qaf. What I suggest is when you read the Quran is to, is to read a lot. And don't worry about every word that you don't get. And what you really want, want to do is what you really want to do is to go for vocabulary. Don't worry about the shibboleths of grammar and all the rest of it. Oh, yeah, I'm getting to this. What I was going to say is like, I'm not inveighing against the practice of Tajweed. I can see that there are definite benefits to it. For example, it really helps in the preservation of a very exact way of preserving a text orally. But just so that you know, what Tajweed really comes from is a, a kind of cultural calc on the Jewish practice of what's called cantillation. So if you listen to rabbis reciting the Torah, they have a, a form of cantillation, which if you hear it, you'll say that this is very, very much like Tajweed. Well, clearly what's happened is that the Arabs heard them doing it and they did something similar. So you will hear the the, the the rabbis going Birishit bara Elohim eta shamayim va'etaritz, and this is quite similar. You know, we we okay, right? It sounds very similar to what we hear with various types of uh, of um, recital of the Quran. But they also have a, a, a tradition of just reading it. Birishit bara Elohim eta shamayim va'etaritz like you wanted to understand what was being spoken. Well, this entire thing is missing from the traditionalists' preoccupations. So what you all you have is this highly liturgical kind of manner, and I'm not saying it doesn't have a benefit. Certainly, there are times when, you know, one's soul wishes to... to you know, kind of expand in that way. Certainly, for example, you know, to take the kind of the, the Tanakh equivalent of something like Psalms, which are only ever, you know, read, sung. Um, but the problem is that what the traditionalist has done, and I'm prepared to accept that some of his motivations, maybe all of his motivations, were of the highest and most noble, you know, order. But what he's done is he's made the entry level so complicated and so difficult that you can't understand this. Let's say you've managed to remember all of the uh, all of the meanings of the of the of the grammar and this highly complex grammar there before you start. Okay, you've got that. Now you can't even read it. You can't go because no, there's got to be you no know, kala There's got to be this for this and is it ah uh, on uh, you know wow doubled you know elided and so on and so forth. It's Again, to put it in driving terms, what you're requiring somebody to explain the molecular components of a car. Just give me the keys, man. Let's get in it and see how we do. I learned by I learned to drive by driving. I didn't learn to drive 
by reading the theory of the development of 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 car you know of car mechanics since the Roman times. I just really didn't, and I don't believe anybody did. I don't believe anybody did. And I go back to my computer uh, analogy: if we'd if we'd learnt how to use computers in the same way as schools teach us mathematics, or you know they try to teach how to read the Quran there wouldn't be any computers because it would just be nobody would have learned it it's, it's unlearnable it goes back to my thing the professor russian is very difficult really <laughs> well i'm going to find myself another professor in that case somebody who doesn't think it's really difficult somebody who thinks i can actually learn this and, and i did i transferred to a different university because i didn't like the cut of his jib I, I didn't consider that he was somebody i could learn i was there to learn russian i wasn't there to try to learn russian or to have a you know a, a kind of a go at it i wanted to learn it you know it's it russians do it every day first time i came to russia i heard somebody talking to their dog in russian i thought well how, how complicated can it really be do you know what i mean so now we're going to get into what we want to do with this when you learn your own language you didn't learn about grammar, I promise you. Um, I'm not sure because I've actually lost track because I've, I'm making this video for the second time, but either earlier in this talk or in the last one that I lost all of, there's a, a boy that I met called Jack, now I think I haven't mentioned it here, who was about two and a half or three. And uh, when I was at my first year at university, no, actually I fin finished university. So I had a degree in a very difficult <laughs> language. And I remember watching Jack at two and a half, three, and he said, I want a cup of tea. I want a cup of tea. And guess what happened to him? He got a cup of tea, or something a bit like approximating a cup of tea. What he didn't do is work out all the grammar. I, okay, that's a personal pronoun. Want is a verb. Conjugate the verb, first person singular. A is a, A is, okay, A, so that must be, it must be, um, okay, that's, that's an article, indefinite article. A cup, okay, cup cup of something genitive uh, of tea okay no he didn't do that he didn't know any of that he just learned i want a cup of tea he learned that and then he realized that you know what i can say i want a cup of milk i want a cup of orange juice i want a cup of water or he wants a cup of milk he wants a cup of tea he wants a cup of water if you start learning languages in these blocks right rather than just individual words and then trying to fit them together you'll find it a lot easier other thing i want to say when you learn the Quran, the Quran has got this sort of like this this curve to, to the, the, I'm not talking about grammar, I would pretty much forget about grammar, but it's got, the, the vocabulary has got this curve to it. So I don't know exactly which words these are, but you'll find that there'll be some words, well, you'll come across them, this is what happened, even if you don't really know any vocabulary, you'll come across these words. Let's say Allah, okay, so you learn that word, Allah, okay, I've got that one word. You now know whatever it is, 2,900 words. Or something. There was about 66, 68,000 words in the Quran. You now know, let's say it's 2,000 of them. Whoa, you know, that's already, that's, that's quite a chunk. And then you come to another word, whatever it is, you know, yukminun or whatever it is, you know, just, okay, well, now you've got another 500. You, you'll start building these up really, really quickly. Now, what they know, they, the ubiquitous state, about learning languages is that the, the, the magical way of learning a language is stories. When you're reading stories, well, what is the Quran? It is basically stories. That's all it is. Where you're meeting vocabulary that you already know with some new vocabulary. I was thinking this Quran is the perfect actual tool for this because that's precisely what it does. So you can build up quite quickly if you don't you know, obsess about grammar. You can build up like a working vocabulary really quickly. Um, and... The way I suggest to do it is to read quite a lot. I mean, where you, depending on your level, the amount that you can kind of take in in a day will, will, will vary. But as you build up your skill with it and your sort of a, kind of acquaintance with it, what will happen is you'll just start re every reading session. You're basically repeating. You're coming Allah, Allah. Okay, I know that one. Or Rahim. Okay, I know that one. Or whatever it is, and you're you're com you're compounding your knowledge of words that you've already learned and that's really satisfying and then you're coming across something new and so you learn that as a if you can it's not always possible but if you can as a collocation and a collocation is like two or three words that kind of go together one a cup of tea okay if you learn i 
and then want and then a and then cup of tea that's kind of like a lot but and putting that together would be very complicated but if you learn i want a cup of tea as one thing then when you learn he wants oh he wants a cup of tea she wants she wants a cup of tea they want we want it all this different stuff but trying to learn all of the case system or the in, in this case or all the, in english the tense system I don't. I don't even. I. I have actually have a language teaching qualification. I can't even tell you how many. I think it's fourteen tenses. I expect somebody will correct me down below. In the English language, it is really complicated. But we don't use most of those. Just use the bits that you need. At, like with computers, <clears throat> don't try to do. Don't try to fight a battle you haven't reached yet. And this is what happens with the teaching that I've seen of the Quran. Is they're trying to load you up with every single possible permutation that you could possibly need and it's too much it's just depressing and it's not very interesting and your mind will go you know what i'm going to check out <clears throat> whereas if when you get to a thing you think you know what i've noticed that this is this has got this at the end and this has got this at the end and every time i do that it has this at the end and this is a bit different why is that a bit different and now you want to know and uh, why didn't you go and find out? You can find out. And now you have a piece of information that you can apply to something else. And this more organic way of learning is interesting. <laughs> you start to become a bit of a, a noticer. You've got to notice it. You can't learn something you didn't notice. So you, you, you read it and you go, know, ah, why, why would that be the case? And you start asking why. Now, now, sure, grammar, fantastic. Go and check it out. See if you can find an answer. Why didn't it happen last time? And, and when you do find the answer, you'll really learn it. But what you won't ever be able to do, nobody can do. Jack couldn't do it with English. I couldn't do it with English. I didn't do it with, well, when I learned Russian at university, I learned all of these crazy laws and rules. And when I started to speak Russian, it's because I managed to get all of that out of my head and just start talking without really worrying about it and not worrying about mistakes. In fact, who cares? Just just talk. <clears throat> so what we're doing now is thinking in terms of I want a cup of tea. <clears throat> so you find something and um, let's say as you build up, you know, a kind of an acquaintance with this, you'll know I and you'll know want and but maybe you don't know cup of tea. Maybe you don't know that bit. But if you get the collocation, I want a cup of tea, you already know which bit is new to you. So you, you'll know what it is that you're learning. So anyway, I hope that makes some sense. Don't get too driven down with the grammar. Don't feel intimidated by it. <clears throat> the holy Arabic speakers of the holy language of Arabic, they don't use these endings. If you listen to people speaking fusha, speaking this so-called modern standard Arabic, they're all very vague on the endings and they generally tend to ignore them. They're not speaking like this. No Arab is natively speaking Quranic Arabic. None. Don't exist. They don't exist like no Englishman is natively speaking Shakespearean English. So, again, I'm not you know, trying to denigrate the, the Arabic speakers or, or, or their understanding of the Quran. I'm just trying to put it into a context because, you know, just because it looks like spaghetti to you doesn't mean that it's, you know, it's all like high order Quranic Arabic. So this is how I do it. And I'll just show you. What you want to do is read a lot. So, and what I do is I read to myself the same way as I would read any book I was interested in. What I don't do is, you know, sing and shout. Because I don't believe that it's possible to understand this book by, by singing and shouting. If singing and shouting helps you to understand it, great for you. But it doesn't help me. What helps me is reading it quietly and thinking about what I'm reading, just like any other book. Um, so what I would do is, I would, let's say we start off, you know, okay, I'm going to read this page. If I'm using this edition, there are 604 pages, that's it. So here's one of them, okay. So I'm reading, let's say, Qaf wal Quran al Majid. Okay, let's say I don't know the word Majid. Actually, I do know the word Majid, but for argument's sake, let's say I don't know it. Um, okay, so... I can either, what I, I hope you can see this. Yeah, that's the closest we can get with this. What I'm doing is I'm kind of open, almost like a little corner, open bracket and close bracket. That's it with pencil. Now this pencil is 0.5. If you use anything bigger than that, a bigger 
engaged than that, what will happen is it'll just clutter up the page with stuff and you won't be able to see anything. So uh, keeping keep reading. بَلْ عَجِبُوا أَنْ جَاءَهُمْ مُنْذِرٌ مِّنْهُمْ فَقَالَ الْكَافِرُونَ هَذَا شَيْءٌ عَجِيبٌ Okay, I'm alright with that. I understand that. Okay, maybe you don't. Maybe there are bits in that you don't know. Doesn't matter. But for me, let's say I'm carrying on. Read, read, read. Okay, here's a bit. Let's say that I either don't know it or I want to review it or it's not a very uh, common expression, something like this. Again, remember, with, with Allah, you've already got however many it is, 2,000, 3,000 words or a few other verbs, you know, uh, you'll very quickly build up vocabulary. But let's say I don't know this. So this is Raja'un Ba'id. Raja'un Ba'id. I don't, let's say I don't know that. and and Or let's say that Ba'id, I do know that, and it's far or distant. But I don't know Raja. Okay, so I don't know that. But I can see that these things go together. And so I'm going to use these as a collocation, as two things that go together. Remember, one a cup of tea. I'm going for that. So I put my open and close bracket on either side of this. And I read through the whole thing. And I'm picking out either single words or preferably a couple of two or three words that go together. And let's just have another one. Fi amarim marij. Well, actually, for me, let's say marij is a very uncommon word in the Quran. So amar, I know. Fi, obviously, I know fi amarin marij. So marij is, let's say, is the thing that I want to. Uh, let's see, you can see that is the thing that I want to concentrate on here. So I'm going to take that fi amarin marij. So I'm going to take that whole thing, and I'm going through, and that's be my first pass. So this is great because now I've already read it. I kind of know the page. I know what's going on in the page, and then I go through, and I hope you can see this on this inside. On this inside margin because what we don't want to do is to write all the Arabic again on the page because it just gets very messy we've already got it beautifully presented why why repeat it when it's just using up valuable real estate so what I do is I I've got one here okay so that's the only one on that line so I write the number one here I go to the next line no there's none there the next line there's one here and another one here so that's two and three so i put a three down here so i'm putting the running totals at the end of the lines all the way down here and so what i've got is one three four five six seven nine twelve so this last one down at the down at the bottom corner here i hope you can see this he were uh khalakin jadid okay well khalaka now this jadid let's say that's a new word for me Jadid means new. So, but but in Jadid, this is quite useful. It's an, a new creation. So I have that there. I'm going to use that. Remember, you know, one a cup of tea. I'm building that up as a, a collocation. Those two words go together. So I know that on this page, there's going to be uh, about 12. Well, actually, there are 12. I mean, you may come back to it later on and find there's another one or something. But let's, okay, 12. I've now got a rough idea of how I can manage the space on this page. Now, if you if you find that you've got like 40 or something like that, well, you know, you're going to have to manage the page in a slightly different way. But let's say you've got 12, you'll find some pages you've got two or three, some pages you've got nothing at all, some pages, you, let's say, especially in certain parts of the Quran, there are lots, you're at a different stage in your learning. But, but by the time you've been through this process, you already know and you haven't used any of your real estate. OK, so now you can plan what you're going to do. The way I do it is this. So what we don't want to do is write Arabic everywhere because we've already got it written down. We've, we, we know where stuff is. They're very easy to find. And so let's take the first one. El Majid or Majid. And I just write up here. In brackets, one, glorious or illustrious. Uh, then we go to the next one, number two. So where's number two? We know we can just look down this line and see where things are. That was number one, so number two must be on this line. It's we. You can just mentally very quickly work it out. So Raja Um Baid, Baid. So there we are. Okay, so that's number two. Number two, far or unlikely return. Okay, and. I already know roughly how much of the page I'm going to need, how much I can allow myself to use, and also why I don't recommend um, writing 
why I don't recommend writing the words directly, the translations directly above the words on the page. It's very difficult to manage it. And also you become very lazy. And, you know, you'll find that a very short word in Arabic requires quite a long, you know, explanation in English. And you, you can't manage this. Now, they used to do this. If you if you look at some of the, uh, the, the manuscripts of some of the Persian kings, they, they had, you know, sort of sort of interlinear translations of this type. But I've looked at different ways of doing it, and I just don't think it's very efficient. And I also don't think it's a very good way of learning because you become lazy. You just look there, look there, look there, look there. You won't really learn them. But in this method, you can see instantaneously, if you read this page again, that this is a word that you have not known in the past because it's got these two little kind of like corners. You know precisely the extent of your collocation, whether it's just one word like I w like want or whether it's a, a longer thing like I w want a cup of tea, you know, with, and you know instantly whether I already know it. Well, if I already know it, I can just carry on going. And also you have a feeling of, oh, great, I've learned that one. So th that's how I do it. There's a, another thing which I haven't done on this page, but I'm going to tell you about, and it will kind of help draw this to a close. And you'll see why I've been, uh, why I rather emphasise the writing of the surah numbers and the verse numbers to facilitate getting around the Quran when you're reading it. And it's really to do with something I've already alluded to, which is the great value of reading stories and r meeting words that you already know it, with new stuff coming in. If you use, for example, uh, a good resource is corpus, C-O-R-P-U-S dot Quran dot com. You can very, very quickly pull up um, a, a number of references which have got a similar verb or the same verb of, of the same type or the same noun of the same type in different parts of the Quran, different verses. So what I also do, I haven't done it here because I didn't think to do it, but I'll just sort of show you what I mean. Having planned out your real estate, like let's say, okay, what is it, 12 words that we've, we've done on our sort of test page. Um, let's say you've got enough space you can plan that space and you can plan to if you are interested to write let's say let's say majid let's say majid occurs two or three other times in the in the quran you can look those up and just write here five you know i don't know what it is five 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 two six seven um, seventy five fifteen and th that will be a note to you to say this something similar or the same is found elsewhere in the Quran and you can just go to it and read that and it's really really beneficial to, to see the same word being used in different places what you're doing is you're compounding your apprehension of the text and you'll find that you it starts to mean something especially if you don't obsess about grammar in the first instance I would leave it and only come to it when you have a question because uh, you'll notice it. You'll notice it. Why, 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 why is it doing that? Now you need grammar. OK, that's the time to go to grammar books. Like you would with a car, you know, why is the engine making this noise? Well, I find when I when I when I go between second and third, it's doing this. OK, now you need to learn something about gearboxes or changing oil or whatever it is. But you don't need all that information just to, just to start driving. And all it's going to do is stop you from doing it. I think that's everything I would I would add to this. The benefit of reading. Quite a lot reading in passes, like let's say we've just done one page, right? Uh, sort of off it consists of one, two, almost three pages. So you just do a page a day and, you know, you read it that same page a few times and then you read the next page and then you can go back and read those two pages. You start to build it up and then you find, you know what, I can read that sort of, I can read that sort of as well. And then you start reading other ones and you come across words. That it's very satisfying when you when you come across words that you already know or you're recognizing now the roots, even if it's in a slightly different kind of verbal you know, maybe it's a, a form eight or, a, you know, it's a form four, or it's a form this. But you don't need to know all of that stuff at the beginning. Just get a general idea of the language. Uh, just just a basic overview. 
but but don't take it all too don't make it all so complicated and then you start to work it okay that okay this word normally goes with this why is it going with this one now especially if you start noting collocations remember one a cup of tea so that's that you'll find if you just keep reading keep reading keep reading and you get into the habit of reading to understand rather than understanding in order to read you'll enjoy it and you'll get more from it my advice would be don't obsess with Tajui. Don't let them do it to you because it will just stop you from doing anything unless you enjoy it. If you enjoy it and you can you can read like that and really understand what you're talking about, fantastic. I, I don't find it particularly beneficial. I also don't find it particularly appropriate, to be perfectly honest. Certainly there are there are verses which are, you know, many, many sorrows which are exalted but there are we have we have um sort of about women's monthly courses and so on you listen to Kari's reading this and you think i don't think you're really listening to what you're saying yourself to be perfectly honest this this isn't that kind of verse it's, it, this is uh it's practical stuff um but anyway that's what i've learned read to understand because you'll enjoy it and you'll become free in a way. And as you read more each day, you'll repeat stuff that you already know. And really the goal, I would say, and to be fair to the traditionalists, they've done a very, some of the prints they do in, are, are really beautiful. I mean, this one, I, I think the paper production is really good. They've set it out in a way, so if you can, if you can hit, you know, if you can read one Jews a day, which means you get through the whole of the Quran in one month, that really difficult vocabulary, that those last, whatever it is, 500 or 600 words that only occur once or twice, you'll be hitting them once a month and you'll, you'll pick them up as well. So that's how to do it. That's what I do. I've tried different systems and this is what works for me. If you find bits of it work for you, obviously that's fine too, you know. People on my channel, you know, I know that they're intelligent and that they take some of what I say and, you know, adapt it to to their own circumstances. And and, and that's what that's the the kind of the, the the way in which I'm presenting this. This is what's worked for me in my system of trial and error and so on. And so I, I hope some of it works for you. That's it. Um, if I've missed anything, it's because I think I've already said it because I said it in the first one, which didn't record the audio. I'm now going to see if this one did record the audio. I will try to drop another video in the next few days, God willing. Um, and I might make a video soon as well with some sort of update on what's going on with me. So, but not that now is not time for that. So I'm going to drop that now. I hope everyone's well. And uh, as I say, I'll try to drop another video in the next in the next week or so. If you're listening on YouTube, you can download my full translation of the Quran free and all other work free using the button in the top right hand corner or buy the hard copy there at 10% less than on Amazon, at least in the near future, I hope. You can download the audio from my YouTube videos to your mobile device using the links in the drop down below. I recommend meetquranites.com to connect with other Quran alone believers. Like if you like, comment if you have something constructive to say, and subscribe to get more each week. And use the link in the drop down below to donate if you would like to help me keep doing this. And remember, this life is short, eternity is long. If you want good trees, plant good seeds.